Serial killer Robert Knapper is one of Britain's most dangerous and depraved killers. In 1995, he was sent to join fellow psychopath Peter Sutcliffe in Broadmoor for the horrific slaying of a mother and her four-year-old child. Then, 12 years later, he was convicted of one of the highest profile murder cases ever seen in the UK. I mean, they were up with the 49 stab wounds we established at uh, post-mortem. I dealt with rape attacks, but I've never seen anything like this before. My name is David Wilson, and I've spent my entire career studying or working with serious and violent offenders. I'm particularly known for studying serial murderers, and my hypothesis is that serial killers don't emerge fully formed when we first hear about them in the media. They're a long time in the making. So the challenge for me is not to discover when they stopped killing, but to discover when they first started to kill to see if they can be connected to other unsolved murders. In all my years as professor of criminology at Birmingham City University, I've learned one important lesson. If criminology is to have real meaning, it can't just be discussed in libraries or in lecture theatres, but it has to be reconnected to real crimes and to real people. So I'm going to get out of the university and reconsider some of the most complicated modern cases of serial murder to see if those serial killers have been getting away with murder. I want to use my new hypothesis on crime to look at the case of Robert Knapper, to try to understand how this evil psychopath was able to evade capture for so long, despite him leaving a catalogue of clues that could have led to his arrest years before and prevented a campaign of brutality and violence against countless women. To find the answers, I first need to understand the crimes. This, uh flat behind me is the site of the last murder that Robert Napa would commit. It was a double murder of a mother and her daughter, Samantha and Jasmine Bissett. And the first thing that strikes me about this scene is it's lots of trees, alleyways, places that Napa might have been able to have spied on his chosen victims. There's me. <laughs> Doing the recording. Hello, there's JJ. His chosen victims were 27 year old Samantha Bissett and her four year old daughter Jasmine, who were found brutally killed in Plumstead, South East London, on the 3rd of November 1993. What has shocked police is the ferocity of the murders. A senior officer said Sam Bissett's injuries were horrific. To this day, the killings still haunt everyone touched by them. I've come to meet Samantha's partner, Conrad Elam. Conrad, could you tell me a little bit about Samantha? What, what sort of person was she? Her day-to-day -day life revolved around her daughter Jasmine, and waking up in the morning, preparing her breakfast and getting her dressed, and then taking to various nurseries or taking her swimming. She was very, um, you know, very devoted to her daughter. Can you tell me a little more about Jasmine? What sort of little girl was she? Oh, she was adorable. Had she started school? She was just about to start school. She was just leaving nursery. Actually, on the day of the murder, it would have been her first visit to a school to you know, decide which school she was going to go to. It's my understanding that it was you that discovered Samantha and Jasmine, is that correct? That's true, yeah. Well, what, that must have been a horrendous scene that you discovered. Yeah, it was a tremendous shock, definitely. I was there most of the time, but I'd sometimes stay at my dad's house in Sidcup. Mm -hmm. That's the reason I wasn't in the flat when she was murdered. Oh, gosh. Otherwise, I might have been there, so... And things might have been very different. Yeah. Instead, Conrad stumbled on a scene of utter horror. I spent 25 years in the Metropolitan Police investigating major crime. The police discovered a scene where an obvious frenzied attack had taken place. 
a premeditated frenzied attack. I dealt with rape attacks before, and I've dealt with violent uh, assaults, but I've never seen anything like this before. I teach my students that securing access to victims and the opportunity to kill them are the key factors driving serial killers' behaviour. Understand these elements and you will understand the killer's pattern of murder. Knowing how Napa planned his attacks is crucial. One of the windows was uh, not locked. We believe that Napa gained access via that window and uh, attacked Samantha in the hallway. She suffered multiple stab wounds up to 60 times and her body was mutilated to the extent that uh, internal organs were removed and in fact a piece of her abdomen was taken from the scene as a trophy by Napa. Jasmine was asleep in her bedroom and uh, we know that uh, she was murdered by asphyxiation but that at some time before her death she was indecently assaulted by Napa. Thankfully, all stranger attacks are incredibly rare, and unprovoked frenzied attacks like this one are even rarer. A double murder with multiple stabbings demonstrates to me the self-confidence of a killer who's done this before. Crucially, Napa makes two mistakes in this crime scene. He leaves behind uh, a footprint that belongs to a rather unique training boot, and there's also a fingerprint which is left at the scene. Luckily for police, Napa had committed a minor offence four years earlier, meaning his fingerprints were on file. At first, these fingerprints were thought to be Samantha's own prints. Uncannily, Samantha and Robert Napa had very similar fingerprints, which was why there was an initial delay in getting the name of the suspect. The most tragic element of this evil crime is that it could have been prevented. In 2009, the Independent Police Complaints Commission published a verdict on the catalogue of errors that allowed Napa to evade capture for years, during which time he left a trail of victims across the southeast of England. One attack on a mother and child little more than a year earlier would become one of Britain's most notorious and high-profile unsolved murder cases of recent times. I'm investigating serial killer Robert Napper to see if I can link him to other unsolved murders. After the horrific murder of Samantha and Jasmine Bissett in 1993, police knew they were on the trail of a dangerous psychopath and finally had the evidence they needed to link the crime to Robert Napa. When the fingerprint evidence suggested that, in fact, Robert Napa was responsible for being in the flat, it was decided to conduct a surveillance operation he was seen using buses and trains, and he was followed around the Charing Cross area where he was seen to look into the window of a knife shop on at least one occasion. He would take a bus or a train further on than he actually wanted to go to in order to get home. He would get off and then walk some distance, and that would perhaps suggest that he was aware of being followed. The decision was taken to arrest Napa in the house. His premises were thoroughly searched and uh, an A to Z map book was found. There were many, many pages that had markings on them and the flat that uh, Jasmine and Samantha lived in was marked clearly. With Napa finally in custody, a picture emerged of a man who'd been hunting female victims for years. Police now realised that as far back as 1989, Napa's mother had reported that he'd confessed to raping a woman on Plumstead Common. They didn't follow it up, and Napa was never even questioned. The first 
in a series of catastrophic blunders that would leave Napa free to attack women at will. The rape was one of the first of a series so disturbing that they became known as the Green Chain Rapes. Barry Porter was a detective who investigated them in the early 1990s. The Green Chain Walk is a series of paths that traverses all across South London through Crayford, Greenwich, Plumstead, all the way out to the west to, uh, to Lewisham. What period of time are we talking about? Uh, the first one was in 1989. There were two children in the house who were watching TV at the time. The victim was upstairs in her bedroom and he went upstairs, committed the offence and then left. This has echoes of the Samantha Bissett case. I mean, he's invading a home. The second victim that was in Lee High Road, that time he followed his victim from a bus uh, and pulled her to the ground. The third victim he sat next to, just off of King John's Walk, uh, and engaged in a little bit of conversation before he then attacked her. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was when the attack started to escalate because that's the first time that he'd used the knife. The fourth attack was a blitz attack. She got to a narrowing part of the green chain walk and he attacked the girl from behind uh, and beat her savagely around the, uh, the face before he raped her. She'd seen him beforehand, so she gave a very, very good description and a very good e-fit that she did. So, Barry, you've got DNA. Had you anybody on your database that you could match that DNA to? We sampled hundreds of people during this inquiry. Including Robert Napper? Robert Napper was asked to come in on two occasions, but they didn't pursue it because he was six foot two and, and our victim had said he was five foot seven, five foot eight. The height difference proved to be a red herring. As now police at last had Napper's DNA, they could link him to at least four of these attacks. But on many others, no DNA trace was found. Sometimes we're talking about teenagers, other times we're talking about 30-year-old women. Yeah. Uh, how many rapes are we talking about? You said there were four, but I mean, do, are, are there more rapes? There was a number, I mean, and we're talking probably over 100. That you think could be linked to Napa? Quite possibly, yeah. Well, when did they stop? When Napa was arrested for Samantha and Jasmine Bissett's murder. Do you think he may have killed other people than we know about? I know that they looked at some other murders, but there's never been any evidential link to them. But I, I couldn't say, I couldn't put my hand on my heart and say he hasn't. I, I think he probably did. I thought that interview with Barry was interesting for two reasons. Firstly, in relation to the green chain rapes. Before Napa's arrested, over 100 such rapes. After he's arrested, none whatsoever. But it was really interesting to hear that the police had also considered Napa for some unsolved murders. So criminologically, all this suggests to me that Napa's worth further scrutiny in relation to cold cases. In October 1995, after pleading guilty to the manslaughter of Samantha and Jasmine Bissett on the grounds of diminished responsibility, Napa was detained indefinitely in Broadmoor High Security Hospital. Yet it would be another 10 years before DNA evidence would finally link Napa to one of the UK's most high-profile murder cases, a crime that had laid unsolved for over a decade. I don't suppose many people associate murder with the leafy suburbs of Wimbledon, but this is the scene of where Rachel McKell was murdered in the most appalling circumstances in front of her little boy. And I imagine whilst most people have heard of Rachel McKell and possibly also of Colin Stagg, who was wrongly arrested for her murder, I doubt if many people have heard of the man who actually did commit this murder, Robert Napper. And so I've come here to find out more about the circumstances in which Rachel McKell was murdered. On the morning of the 15th of July, 1992, 23-year-old Rachel McKell was brutally stabbed in a frenzied attack. Michael Murray, a retired architect, regularly walked his dog on Wimbledon Common. He was the first person to find Rachel's body, and what he discovered that day will never leave him. My dog decided 
to uh, go up a wooded path. And at the top of the path, I saw a pair of bare legs, and I thought it must be somebody sunbathing. But as we got closer, I could see that she was covered in blood, and there was a, a little boy holding her arm. When I uh, got up to where she laid, her eyes had no life in them at all. My first thought was for the child. I think he was in shock. Was he saying anything? Yes, he just said, get up, mummy. He was trying to pull her up, but she was, of course, uh, dead by then. The young mother was brutally murdered in broad daylight, just a few hundred yards from the famous windmill, which is the Commons landmark. She was found with her throat slashed. Her son, just two years old, was found clutching her blood-stained body. The brutal murder quickly became front-page news around the world, leading to one of the most high-profile police investigations in history. Detective Sergeant Ron Turnbull was the first officer at the scene. Ron, were you able to make an initial assessment about the injuries that Rachel had received? Yes, you could see that uh, the majority of the injuries that uh, were upper body and, and around the neck area. I mean, they were upwards of 49 stab wounds we established at, at post-mortem. This was a possibility of being a stranger murder, a frenzied attack. Ron, were there any witnesses that were useful to the police at the time? There were a number of women who saw men of various descriptions. One uh, which became quite important was a man not far away from where her body was found, actually looking as if he was washing his hands in a stream. They went on to make efits or artist impressions of, of uh, his description. There were obviously suspects that would have to be eliminated. Local suspects, yes. Local suspects. But crucially, Robert Napper was never one of those. Napper was never a suspect for the Rachel Nickel uh, murder. Napper never even came into the radar. The reason that Napa wasn't on the radar was that police had already alighted on the man they thought was responsible. An effort had been created of a man described as white, six foot tall, with a distinctive stoop in his walk. It was here that police made another mistake, referred to in the IPCC report as gross errors of judgment and a misdirected investigation, which would allow Napa to remain free to kill. They fixated on the resemblance between the photo fit and local resident, Colin Stagg. Stagg had been on the common at the time, but what no one realized was, so had Robert Napper. Stagg quickly became the prime and only suspect. Investigative journalist Ted Hines followed the Nickel murder inquiry for over 10 years. Robert Napper wasn't originally arrested for the murder of Rachel Nickel, but Colin Stagg was. Why was that? Police officers parachuted in the cracker-style criminal profile of Paul Britton. Paul Britton produced a profile, as his job, of what he thought the killer would be like. The criminal profile revealed the killer would be between 20 and 30 years old he'd be a loner and have no interaction with women. On paper, Stagg matched the profile perfectly. But so did Robert Napper. Britton said the chance of two people fitting the profile and being on the common the same day was vanishingly small. But two people were, and police had already hatched a convoluted sting operation to trap the wrong one. So how did the police then go about trying to get evidence to charge Stagg with Rachel's murder. It was decided to use an undercover police officer as a honey trap. I was suspected of it, you know. Mm -hmm. I want to tell, tell you, like I told everybody, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I've never done anything, you know. You know, because a lot of people do suspect I did it. Colin Stagg never confessed to the murders, but police were convinced that they had their man and the case went to court. After 13 months in custody, the judge dismissed the case on the very first day of the trial, and Stagg was finally released. My life has been ruined by stories written to satisfy the strange sexual requests of an undercover police officer. All that time, Robert Napper would be at large, 
Robert Napper wasn't on anyone's radar. He was the man in the shadows, the guy who crept through the undergrowth, peeping Tom, stalking, but no one knew about Robert Napper. It wasn't until 2006, when new forensic techniques were developed, that a tiny speck of DNA discovered on Rachel's body could be analyzed. It was run through the new DNA database, and with Napper already behind bars, they finally made the connection. After 14 years, Rachel's killer was finally brought to justice, and Napa was returned to Broadmoor indefinitely under the Mental Health Act. Rachel Nickel was murdered in July 1992, Samantha and Jasmine Bissett in November 1993. And the escalation between those two murders is quite horrific. That's the behaviour that you can't simply switch off. And if you think about the dates between Rachel and Samantha and Jasmine, we've got a 16-month gap. I think Napa must have been killing between those two events, and that's what I've got to investigate. I'm looking into the horrific crimes of Robert Napper to see if I can discover whether he could be responsible for other brutal crimes that as yet remain unsolved. To do this, I want to enlist the help of some of my most talented postgraduate students at Birmingham City University. What sort of picture are you developing about Robert Napper that will help me move forward in thinking about unsolved cases? He's choosing green areas where he knows that young women will be out in broad daylight. We know he's travelling on the trains and buses. They're saying that Napa regularly travelled through the underground or using the rail network. That means that he's kind of geographically mobile. So I have to consider the whole greater London area seems to have a fascination with knives. The sort of increase in severity. We're dealing with blitz overkill attacks. They're unusual cases to think about. So I think what the students have done is help me focus a little more on what types of cold cases might be attached to Robert Napa. My students have helped me to build a profile of Robert Napa that shows a psychotic sexual predator who would stop at nothing to satisfy his violent hatred of women. To understand what created this monster, I need to look into his past. Robert Napper was born in Kent, the eldest of four siblings. He was introduced to violence from an early age through his parents' abusive relationship. Napper would replicate this behavior and would violently assault his siblings. As a child, he was diagnosed with a mental disorder and received counseling for six years. A victim of sexual abuse himself at a young age, he became introverted and a recluse. He was later diagnosed with Asperger's and paranoid schizophrenia. By his early 20s, Napa's sickening crime wave was beginning. He moved out of home and he went to live alone in Plumstead, South London. Napa replied for a job and we took him on. He was sitting on a machine for 12 hours in a day, packing, trimming. Nobody perceived him as a threat whatsoever. He could walk past you and you wouldn't take a blind bit of notice of him at all. He blended in so well. As far as I was concerned, he was totally normal. He was obviously an incredibly clever man, or cunning, for the length of time he got away with this. To find out who he might have got away with attacking, I've asked one of my more experienced master students to look for cold cases that bear Napa's hallmarks from right across the capital. So Grace, I asked you to research unsolved knife attacks on lone women between 1989 and 1994 in the Greater London area. What have you discovered? The first one is Claire Tiltman, who was killed in Greenhithe, uh, Kent, Greater London in 1993 at the age of uh, 16. She was stabbed over uh, 40 times in uh, alleyway and it fits with the time frame of 
of Napa as it was 10 months before Samantha visit and six months after Rachel Nickel. So Grace, what was the second case you came across? Uh, the second case was um, of Jean Bradley, who was killed in 1993 in Acton. She was killed in a frenzied knife attack. The attacker was actually stopped halfway through by a uh, passerby. Uh, so we've actually got a, a, a witness then that can describe the attacker? Yeah, they described him as a six foot um, male with brown hair. Well, no, that, that's actually very, very interesting indeed because, of course, Napa is six foot. And both those unsolved murders are between the Rachel Nickel murder and the Samantha Bissett murder. So both these crimes fit into a gap between Napa's known murders. At the time of the Jean Bradley case, police created a crude photo fit of the man this witness saw. But I want to see if I can get a better idea of the perpetrator who was seen repeatedly stabbing his victim in broad daylight. Flowers mark the spot where Jean Bradley was stabbed with a butcher's knife as she collected her car on the way home from work. The high-flying executive was knived repeatedly in what appears a random and motiveless attack. This is the first cold case that I'm going to look at. It's the murder of Jean Bradley in March 1993. I've come to interview somebody who did actually witness this attack, Patrick Cunningham, to see if he can throw some more light onto the case. But the first thing that strikes me is that this is not the area that one would have expected to have seen in relation to the cold cases. It's far too residential, there are too many houses, potential witnesses. Patrick, can I take you back to the night of the 25th of March, 1993? What did you see happening? Well, I drove into Calvary Avenue, and uh, just about this point here, there was a car parked here. Yep. And I came up in my van. Yep. And there was a man and a woman from this point here. Uh, struggling, and then it got more, more physical. He got her to the ground, and he held her by the shoulder, and he had a, a black bag in this hand, and he was actually driving it down into her, like a stabbing motion across the back of her shoulders. And was she screaming? Oh, what she was, was happening? She was really put up a fight. She was a very, very strong woman. And I just wound down the window of the van and shouted out at him. And so when you shouted at him, did he stop the attack? Yes, he did. He stood up, and he ran off down this road here. The woman stood up screaming, so I thought she was OK. So I shot off in my van after him. And can you show me where that is? Yes, he ran down this road here and turned into uh, Gunnery Garden. So tell me what happened here, Patrick. I overtook him, and I got him up here in front of him, and I jumped out at him. And then what did he do? He ran across the road towards Acton Town Station. What we're dealing with here is a blitz attack on a lone female. This is the desire of the perpetrator to utterly obliterate Jean Bradley, to kill her, to murder her. Criminologically, there are some other interesting phenomenon going on, though, as well. Because when he's spotted, he comes back to this particular area and is eventually lost in the South Acton estate. Now, that seems to me to imply some things. It implies, firstly, some planning on his part. He spotted Jean Bradley as she's got out of the tube station. There's something about Jean Bradley that attracts him to her. Now, if we have a witness, and we must use that witness to build up a better picture, visually, facially, of who it is that we're dealing with. Patrick's photo fit of Jean's killer didn't produce any concrete results, but it was using very outdated methods to produce what looks more like a caricature than an exact likeness. Technology is now much more advanced, so I want to use the latest and cutting-edge imaging software to see if we can recreate the killer's image. My name is Steve Driver. I'm a forensic artist. I use the latest EFITV colour software, which is the most advanced facial composite software in the world. Police forces using this software have reported detection rates rising from approximately 15 to over 50%. We didn't tell Patrick about our interest in Napa in connection with this case, nor had anyone else previously made this association for him. This system relies on you to recall certain features in order to be able to construct an EFIT image 
a better quality image of this suspect that you saw back in 1993. Try and imagine yourself at that time, you know, try and picture him in your mind. If it helps you, just shut your eyes to try and focus. It's a very gaunt, gaunt looking face, high cheekbones, uh, hit a, a black kind of a plastic hat, I think it's like a fisherman's hat. His belt was slim, six foot tall. Is there any particular nose or mouth? Maybe the middle one. The mouth seems fine? Yeah. OK. So now we've got to this stage. We've actually grayed his skin tone down. We've added the sou'wester hat. Yeah. We've made his cheeks a little bit gaunter. We've added a little bit more stubble. Are you happy now that we've, we've achieved a good likeness to what uh, you can actually remember? I give it a good likeness. A good likeness. Yeah. Witness identification has been a recurring theme in relation to the cases I've been looking at that were committed by Robert Napa. There have been a number of witness identification of the perpetrator in the green chain rapes. This is a photo fit by the witness who saw the perpetrator on Wimbledon Common when Rachel Nickel was murdered. Now, we had Patrick work with Steve Driver to produce an e-fit, an up-to-date uh, image of uh, a suspect. This face is really still dominated by the sou'wester that the perpetrator that Patrick Challenge was wearing. So I had Steve remove the sou'wester, keep the facial description, put a generic hairstyle on so that we could see more of the particular face. And this, of course, is Robert Napper himself. Now, when we isolate particular features of these photo fits and the e-fit, what we get are a particularly strong but long nose, the thinness of the lips, the downturn of the mouth, to the extent that it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that the person that Patrick encountered the night that Jean Bradley was murdered was indeed Robert Napper. The case of Jean Bradley appears to bear the hallmarks of other crimes that Napper has committed. Random, frenzied knife attacks with multiple stab wounds carried out in broad daylight. Patrick Cunningham lost Napper in the roads close to Acton Station. Nearby South Acton links the main lines to Napper's home in southeast London, and police had already proved that Napper used the transport network extensively whilst under surveillance. Coupled with the updated EFIT, I believe links for him to this case are beginning to stack up. The second cold case I'm looking at also bears some of these hallmarks. 16-year-old Claire Tiltman was brutally murdered in Kent in January 1993, two months before the killing of Jean Bradley. The second cold case is different because it's a murder that takes place out of London. It's a horrific knife attack on a 16-year-old schoolgirl nearby in Kent. Kent is a place that Napa knew. He was born and he grew up there. But more importantly, I also know that he used the transport network to stalk his victims. Let's just see if this case makes sense in terms of the geography, the victim, the MO, the signature. This was a blitz attack on a young woman that resulted in her death. The location of Claire Tiltman's murder was just four stops from where Napa was living at the time. I've arranged to meet Vincent Wright, an ex-Met police officer who's pushed for the case to be reinvestigated. So, Vince, can you tell me a little bit about Claire Tiltman as a person? Yes, she was a 16-year-old schoolgirl. She lived about a mile away from here, up the London Road. To the top of the alley, turn right, is where she was headed for. That's where her friend lives in the estate nearby. Do we actually know where Claire was attacked? The attack happened somewhere along this stretch of the alleyway. She staggered that way, going down to the main London Road. She was found collapsed on the pavement by pedestrian commuters and passing traffic. She was stabbed 
40 plus times. So multiple stab wounds? Yes. So almost a blitz attack? Yes. The injuries were described as being to the throat and upper body. So surely we can presume that if she went that way, her attacker must have gone in that direction. What's up there? Green Hive train station. Vince, were there any contemporaneous descriptions of strangers in the area who might have encountered Claire? Three witnesses described a white male between 5 foot 8 and 5 foot 10, 25 to 28 years of age, brown hair, but of particular note, white training boots. And the word boots, not shoes, is used. Now, that, that of course, rings bells for me. A footprint from a white training boot that Napa owned found at the scene of the murder of Samantha and Jasmine Bissett was one of the key pieces of evidence that led to his capture. This, coupled with the multiple stab wounds Claire suffered and the crime scene's accessibility to the transport network are all factors that fit Napa's known modus operandi from crimes we know he committed. However, my search was about to uncover a connection that would offer even stronger links between Robert Napa's crimes and the murder of Claire Tiltman. Serial killer Robert Napa got away with horrific crimes for years following a number of police errors. Looking at the unsolved murder of Claire Tiltman in 1993, I believe that there are also possible connections to Robert Napa. Former Met Police Officer Vincent Wright believes there are too, and has been investigating the case for over a decade. Vince, what sort of information have you been able to gather? It was checking reports, checking local newspapers, writing letters to hospitals, bit by bit, to piece things together. And um, it certainly has, to my mind, Napa's signature on the attack. Surely the police as an institution must have been just as interested in this perpetrator, Robert Napa, and his potential connection. Uh, yes, they were. They um, formed Operation Enigma, and that threw up a statistical correlation between Rachel Nickel and Claire Tiltman. Now, that's new information. What do you mean? by a statistical correlation? Looking for common factors and things like the number of stab wounds, the style of attack, where the attacks took place, the ferocity. Criminologically, I would call that a smallest space analysis. And if that's already been done between Nickel and Tiltman, that means I've got to look much more closely at Operation Enigma. In criminology, smallest space analysis is a method of comparing unique crime scene signatures to see if multiple crimes were committed by the same perpetrator. Operation Enigma in 1995 was an initiative that used similar techniques on over 200 unsolved murders of women across the UK. It discovered 21 clusters where a murder bore a similarity to at least one other. I've come to meet Paul Hodgson, one of the specialist officers working on Enigma. Some of his findings have never been spoken about on camera before. What was your role on Operation Enigma? Uh, well, I was uh, seconded um, to the National Crime Faculty, which is the location where the operation was to be run out from. So Enigma's looking at unsolved murders yep. of uh, women. Yep. What analysis did you bring to bear on those unsolved murders? We were looking for some unlikely characteristics that had never been looked at before in terms of um, normal, traditional investigative methodologies. Was Rachel Nakel one of those 200 cases, therefore, that was fed yes. into Enigma? The detailed analysis um, in the briefing report that was provided um, identified that there was strong similarities between Rachel Nakel, Claire Tiltman, and Jasmine and Samantha Bissett. So you've got a link way back in 1996. What were the factors that linked those three cases? There were a number of areas which were the, the type of injury, the weapon used, the extent of the, of the numbers of injuries, um, the victimology, the geographic location, post-mortem reports. There was sufficient um, to substantiate a force perhaps reviewing those cases in terms of the possibility of being one person responsible. 
Enigma is proven correct that the, there was a link between the murder of Rachel Nickel and the double murder of the Bissets. And the perpetrator was Robert Napper. Yeah. Did Kent Constabulary reinvestigate the Tiltman murder in light of the information that Enigma generated? To the, to the best of my knowledge, and it's 16 years ago plus, um, I believe there was some uh, review of that case. If Kent Police had reviewed the case, I couldn't understand why Napa hadn't been connected to it. Vincent Wright had asked the same question. So you've been doing quite a lot of research on Napa, mm. his movements, his locations. What sort of research have you been able to do about his whereabouts at the time that Claire Tiltman was murdered? Well, because of the nature of the Claire Tiltman attack, I automatically thought Napa's got to be a strong suspect. I wrote to the Kent police, to the Kent investigation, and uh, they wrote back and uh, disclosed in the letter that at the original time of the Tiltman attack, they thought Robert Napa was in prison. And I started doing some digging. This is date from the year 2000, and it's from the Greenwich Magistrates, Justices Clark, and it details the offence. It was an eight-week sentence, possession of firearms, and um, that disclosed that um, with time served on remand, he was released from prison just before Claire Tiltman was murdered. Have you got the letter that you wrote to yes. the Kent yeah, police yeah, yeah. demonstrating that? The relevant one is this one. And so it says here he was thought to have been in prison, yes. but it now appears he was not. Yeah. This journey into the crimes of Robert Napper has been particularly complex. On the one hand, we've a number of striking similarities between his known crimes and both cold cases. But Operation Enigma didn't link Gene Bradley to Napa, leaving just the updated photo fit from an eyewitness. But as the Rachel Nickel case showed, that can't be viewed as conclusive on its own. However, Enigma did link Claire Tiltman to Napa's known crimes, and that is significant. Kent police declined to be interviewed in this documentary as they didn't want to narrow the search for the perpetrator to just one person. But now we know that he was not in prison at the time of Claire's murder. Is it time for them to focus all of their attention on Robert Napa for this dreadful crime? To mark the 20th anniversary of the murder of Claire Tiltman, a vigil has been arranged in her memory. Claire's friends and family have continued to campaign for justice. This unsolved case is still raising questions in the most public forum in the country. Speaker, 20 years ago this week, Claire Tiltman, a 16-year-old Dartford Grammar girls' school pupil, was stabbed to death in my constituency. Nobody has ever been convicted of this crime. Could the Prime Minister assure the House that this government will continue to provide full assistance to Kent Police to help bring justice for one of Britain's most brutal and unsolved murders? Yeah. Yeah. It is a particularly tragic case because, as he says, the parents of this um, girl have both died. What I would say is, of course, we will do everything we can, but above all, I think it's for other people, anyone who knows anything about this case, to talk to the Kent police, because in the end, uh, it is their responsibility to try and solve this case. Although Kent police say this is inaccurate, I understand that new DNA techniques have found a blood spot on Claire's jacket which hasn't yet been tested to see if it matches Robert Napa's DNA. Some people will argue that with Robert Napa behind bars, he can't harm any other women. But that's not the point. The point is that the people behind me in this church, who walked earlier in Claire's memory, want answers. And most important of all, the family and the friends of Claire want closure. And as far as I'm concerned, that closure is only ever going to come when the police investigate further the idea that Robert Napper is the potential perpetrator of Claire's murder. 
We stick with real-life crime tonight and the Yorkshire Ripper who never struck twice in the same place, but eventually he was to make a very simple mistake. Crimes That Shook the World is next.